I slammed the front door shut, my hands trembling as I clutched the grocery bags. Another day, another argument with Ethan about money. I took a deep breath, trying to compose myself before facing my family. Mom, I need fifty bucks for a new game, Cassius called from the living room, not bothering to look up from his phone. Honey, we've talked about this. We need to cut back on expenses, I said, setting the bags on the kitchen counter. Lydia, my mother-in-law, glided into the room with a disapproving frown. Clara, dear, don't be so stingy. The boy needs to have some fun. I bit my tongue, resisting the urge to snap at her. Lydia, we're barely making ends meet. Ethan lost his job and I'm the only one bringing in money right now. Well, maybe if you worked a little harder, Lydia said, her voice dripping with condescension. Before I could respond, Ethan stumbled into the kitchen, reeking of cheap beer. What's for dinner? I'm starving. I just got home, Ethan. I haven't had time to start cooking yet, I said, trying to keep my voice level. He scowled. What the hell have you been doing all day, sitting on your ass? I've been working, Ethan. Someone has to pay the bills around here, I shot back, my patience wearing thin. Cassius wandered in, his eyes still glued to his phone. So, about that fifty bucks? No, Cassius, I said firmly. We can't afford it right now. But Grandma said I could have it, he whined. I turned to Lydia, my blood boiling. Did you promise him money without talking to me first? She shrugged, a sly smile on her face. The boy deserves a treat now and then. You're always so uptight, Clara. I'm uptight because I'm the only one in this house who seems to care about our financial situation. I exploded, my voice rising. Ethan slammed his fist on the counter. Don't you dare raise your voice at my mother. I felt my chest tighten, my breath coming in short gasps. The room started to spin, and I gripped the edge of the counter to steady myself. Mom? Cassia's voice sounded far away. For once, he actually looked concerned. I'm fine, I managed to say, even as black spots danced in my vision. I just need a minute. Lydia sked. Always so dramatic, Clara. Pull yourself together. I closed my eyes, willing the dizziness to pass. When I opened them again, I saw three faces staring at me with varying degrees of annoyance and indifference. I can't do this anymore, I whispered, more to myself than to them. What was that? Ethan demanded. I straightened up, a sudden clarity washing over me. I said, I can't do this anymore. I'm done being the only one who cares about this family's well-being. Lydia laughed, a harsh, grating sound. Oh, please, what are you going to do? Leave? You've got nowhere to go, dear? Her words hit me like a slap in the face, because I knew they were true. I had no family nearby, no close friends to turn to. I was trapped. I'm going to lie down, I said, pushing past them and heading for the stairs. What about dinner? Ethan called after me. I paused at the foot of the stairs, turning to face them one last time. Figure it out yourselves. I'm taking the night off. As I climbed the stairs, I could hear them bickering in the kitchen. Lydia's shrill voice, Ethan's angry retorts, and Cassius's whining all blended into a cacophony of misery. I collapsed onto the bed, my mind racing. How had my life come to this? When had I become a stranger in my own home, a mere ATM for my ungrateful family? As I lay there, staring at the ceiling, a plan began to form in my mind. I couldn't leave. Not yet. But I could start preparing. I could start fighting back. Tomorrow, I decided, things would change. Tomorrow, I would start taking my life back, one small step at a time. Little did I know, tomorrow would bring a revelation that would shatter the very foundation of my world. I woke up early the next morning, my head pounding from the stress of yesterday's confrontations. The house was quiet, a rare moment of peace before the storm of family drama inevitably hit. I made my way downstairs, hoping to enjoy a cup of coffee alone. No such luck. Lydia was already in the kitchen, rifling through my purse. What are you doing? I demanded, snatching my bag away from her. Lydia smiled, all innocence. Oh, Clara, dear, I was just looking for some change for the paper boy. We don't have a paper boy, Lydia, I said, my voice tight with anger. And even if we did, you have no right to go through my things. She waved her hand dismissively. Don't be so dramatic. We're family, aren't we? Before I could respond, Cassius trudged into the kitchen, his eyes glued to his phone as usual. Mom, I need money for lunch today. I sighed. Cassius, I gave you lunch money on Monday. What happened to it? He shrugged, not looking up. Spent it. On what? I pressed. Stuff, he mumbled. Lydia chimed in. 
Oh, let the boy have his fun, Clara. You're always so tight with money. I felt my blood pressure rising. Lydia, I'm tight with money because we don't have any to spare. Ethan's unemployed, remember? Well, maybe if you worked a little harder. Lydia started, but I cut her off. I work sixty hours a week, I shouted, my patience finally snapping. I'm the only one bringing in any income, and you two are spending it like water. Cassius finally looked up from his phone, his face twisted in a sneer. Grandma says you're just being selfish? I turned to Lydia, fury coursing through me. Is that what you've been telling him? Lydia's face was a mask of innocence. I merely suggested that perhaps you could be a bit more generous with your family. My family? I laughed bitterly. You mean the family that treats me like a walking ATM? The family that doesn't lift a finger to help around the house or contribute financially? Mom, chill out, Cassius said, rolling his eyes. It's not our fault Dad lost his job. No, but it is your fault that you're spending money we don't have on things you don't need, I snapped. Lydia placed a hand on Cassius's shoulder. Don't listen to her, dear. Your mother's just stressed. Why don't you go get ready for school? I'll make sure you have lunch money. As Cassius left the room, I turned on Lydia. Stop undermining me with my own son. I'm merely trying to keep the peace, Lydia said, her voice dripping with false concern. Someone has to, with you flying off the handle at every little thing. Every little thing? I was practically shaking with rage now. You're encouraging my son to waste money we don't have, going behind my back to give him cash, and then painting me as the villain when I try to be responsible. Lydia's eyes narrowed. Be careful. Clara, you wouldn't want Ethan to hear you speaking to his mother this way. Hear what? Ethan's voice came from the doorway. He stumbled into the kitchen, looking hungover and irritable. Lydia's demeanor instantly changed. Oh, nothing, dear. Clara and I were just having a little chat about household expenses. I opened my mouth to protest, but Ethan cut me off. Christ, Clara, are you harping on about money again? Give it a rest, will you? I felt something snap inside me. You know what? Fine. You want me to give it a rest? I will. I'm done. You three can figure out how to pay the bills and keep food on the table. I'm taking a personal day. I grabbed my purse and car keys, ignoring their protests as I stormed out of the house. As I pulled out of the driveway, I saw Lydia in the window a triumphant smirk on her face. Little did she know her victory was short-lived, because as I drove away, I wasn't just taking a day off. I was formulating a plan. A plan to take back control of my life, my finances, and my family. And Lydia? She had no idea what was coming. I returned home late that evening, exhausted but determined. The house was a mess, dishes piled high in the sink and takeout containers littering the coffee table. Ethan was sprawled on the couch, beer in hand, watching TV. "'Where have you been?' he demanded, not bothering to look at me. "'Out,' I replied, curtly hanging up my coat. "'Did you look for jobs today?' Ethan's face darkened. "'What's that supposed to mean? It means exactly what I asked, Ethan. Did you look for jobs?' He stood up abruptly, towering over me. "'You think I'm not trying? You think I enjoy being unemployed?' I stood my ground. I think you're not trying hard enough. We can't keep living like this, Ethan. We're drowning in debt. Oh, here we go again with the money talk, he sneered. Is that all you care about? Someone has to care, I shot back. You certainly don't seem to. Our shouting match was interrupted by Cassius stomping down the stairs. Can you two shut up? I'm trying to study. I turned to him, surprised. You're studying? That's great, honey. What subject? Cassius rolled his eyes. Why do you care? You're always too busy working to pay attention to me anyway. His words stung, but I tried to reach out. Cassius, I know things have been tough lately. Maybe we could spend some time together this weekend? Just the two of us? He laughed bitterly. Yeah, right. Like you'd actually follow through. Don't bother, Mom. I don't need your pity time. As he stormed back upstairs, I felt my heart breaking. When had my sweet little boy turned into this angry stranger? Ethan chuckled humorlessly. Nice try, Clara. You reap what you sow. I whirled on him. What's that supposed to mean? It means you've been so focused on work and money that you've neglected your own son, and now you're surprised he wants nothing to do with you? I felt like I'd been slapped. I've been working to keep a roof over our heads and food on the table. Someone has to be responsible around here. Oh, so I'm irresponsible now? Ethan's voice rose dangerously. 
if the shoe fits, I shouted back. Suddenly, Lydia appeared at the top of the stairs. What's all this commotion? Ethan, dear, are you all right? Ethan's demeanor instantly changed. It's nothing, Mom. Clara's just being difficult again. Lydia descended the stairs, her face a mask of concern. Oh, Clara, dear, when will you learn? All this stress isn't good for anyone. Perhaps if you were a bit more supportive of Ethan during this difficult time. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Supportive? I'm the only one keeping this family afloat. And you two are spending money like water. Lydia's eyes narrowed. Now, Clara, let's not exaggerate. We're family. We support each other. Support? I laughed bitterly. Is that what you call undermining me at every turn? Ha spoiling Cassius behind my back? Ethan stepped between us. Don't you dare speak to my mother that way. I felt something snap inside me. Your mother? What about your wife, Ethan? What about the mother of your child? The room fell silent. Ethan and Lydia exchanged a look that sent chills down my spine. What? I demanded. What aren't you telling me? Lydia's face twisted into a cruel smile. Oh, Clara, you really don't know, do you? Ethan's face paled. Mom, don't. But Lydia was already speaking, her words like daggers to my heart. Ethan isn't Cassius's father, Clara, and you're not the first woman he's deceived. The world seemed to tilt on its axis. I staggered back, gripping the wall for support. What? I whispered, my voice barely audible. Ethan's face was a mask of guilt and anger. Mom, how could you? But I was already moving, grabbing my purse and keys. I couldn't breathe, couldn't think. I had to get out. As I fled the house, I heard Lydia's voice, dripping with false concern. Oh, dear. Was it something I said? The door slammed behind me, leaving me alone in the night, my world shattered into a million pieces. I spent the night driving aimlessly, my mind reeling from Lydia's revelation. By dawn, I found myself parked outside our house, exhausted and numb. I steeled myself and walked inside, determined to confront Ethan and get the truth. The house was quiet as I entered. I found Ethan in the kitchen, nursing a cup of coffee. He looked up, his eyes bloodshot and weary. Clara, I— he began, but I cut him off. Is it true? I demanded. Is Cassius not your son? Ethan's silence was all the confirmation I needed. I felt my world crumbling around me. How could you? I whispered, my voice trembling with rage and hurt. All these years you let me believe? I'm sorry, Ethan interrupted, his voice hollow. I never meant for you to find out like this. Find out like this? I echoed incredulously. When exactly were you planning to tell me? On your deathbed? Before Ethan could respond, Lydia glided into the kitchen, a smug smile on her face. Oh, good, you're back. I was worried you might do something rash. I turned on her, fury coursing through my veins. You? You've known all along, haven't you? You've been holding this over my head for years. Lydia's smile didn't falter. Now, Clara, let's not be dramatic. Family secrets are a burden we all must bear. Family secrets? I laughed bitterly. Is that what you call lying to me for sixteen years about the paternity of my child? Ethan stood up, his face a mask of guilt and anger. Mom, that's enough. This is between Clara and me. Lydia's eyes flashed dangerously. Oh, I don't think so, Ethan. You see, Clara, there's more to this story than you know. I braced myself, knowing whatever came next would shatter what was left of my world. Lydia continued, her voice dripping with false sympathy. You see, Ethan isn't just Cassius's stepfather— He's also not my late husband's son. The room seemed to spin. What are you saying? I'm saying, dear, that Ethan's father was a wealthy man I had an affair with, a man who provided for us handsomely, until he didn't. Ethan's face was ashen. Mom, stop, please. But Lydia was relentless. You want to know why we're always so concerned about money, Clara? It's because we're used to having it, and we're not about to let someone like you stand in our way of getting it back. I felt like I was drowning. So all of this, the constant demands for money, the manipulation, it was all about getting back to some lifestyle you lost? Lydia's mask finally slipped, revealing the cold, calculating woman beneath. We deserve that life, Clara, and you're going to help us get it back. Like hell I am, I spat, my shock giving way to rage. I'm done. I'm done with the lies, the manipulation, all of it. I turned to leave, but Ethan grabbed my arm. Clara! Wait, we can work this out. Think about Cassius. I yanked my arm away. Cassius, the son you've been lying to his entire life? The one you've turned against me with your mother's help? He needs you, Ethan pleaded. No, I said, my voice steel. What he needs is the truth. 
and that's exactly what he's going to get. As I stormed out of the kitchen, I heard Lydia's voice, cold and threatening. You'll regret this, Clara. We'll make sure of it. I paused at the foot of the stairs, my heart pounding. I knew what I had to do next would change everything. But I couldn't live with the lies anymore. Cassius, I called out. Come down here. There's something you need to know. As I heard footsteps above, I steeled myself for the hardest conversation of my life. But for the first time in years, I felt a glimmer of hope. The truth was out, and with it came the strength to fight back against the family that had manipulated me for far too long. Little did I know, this was just the beginning of a battle that would test every ounce of my resolve. The days following my confrontation with Ethan and Lydia were a blur of tension and hostility. Cassius hadn't spoken to me since I revealed the truth about his parentage, and Ethan alternated between pleading for forgiveness and lashing out in anger. Lydia, meanwhile, watched it all with a cold, calculating gaze that sent chills down my spine. I threw myself into work, desperate for, for an escape from the toxic atmosphere at home. But the stress was taking its toll. Headaches plagued me constantly, and I found myself struggling to focus on even the simplest tasks. One morning, as I rushed to get ready for an important meeting, a wave of dizziness hit me. I gripped the bathroom counter, my vision blurring. Clara? Ethan's voice came from the hallway. Hurry up, will you? I need to use the bathroom. I tried to respond, but the words wouldn't come. My left arm felt heavy, numb. Panic rose in my chest as I realized what was happening. Eth, I managed to croak before my legs gave out. I crumpled to the floor, my head slamming against the tile. The next thing I knew I was in a hospital bed, the steady beep of monitors filling the air. A doctor stood at the foot of my bed, her face grave. Mrs. Thompson, you've suffered a minor stroke, she explained. You're lucky your husband found you when he did. I closed my eyes, overwhelmed. A stroke. At forty. How had my life come to this? When can I go home? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. The doctor frowned. You'll need to stay for observation for at least a few days. And when you do go home, you'll need to take it easy. No work. No stress. Your recovery needs to be your top priority. I almost laughed. No stress? In my house? The doctor might as well have asked me to sprout wings and fly. Ethan entered the room then, Lydia close behind. For a moment I saw genuine concern in his eyes, but it was quickly replaced by his usual look of annoyance. So what's the verdict? he asked the doctor. When can she come home? We've got bills to pay, you know. I stared at him in disbelief. I'd just had a stroke and all he could think about was money. The doctor explained the situation, emphasizing the need for rest and recovery. Ethan nodded impatiently, while Lydia's eyes narrowed. Well, Lydia said, her voice dripping with false concern, I suppose we'll just have to manage without you for a while, Clara, though I'm not sure how we'll make ends meet. I felt a surge of anger. I just had a stroke, Lydia. Is money really all you can think about? Lydia's mask slipped for a moment, revealing the cold, hard woman beneath. Life doesn't stop because you're ill, Clara. Bills still need to be paid, food still needs to be bought, your responsibilities don't pause just because you're having personal issues. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Personal issues? Is that what you call a stroke? Ethan stepped in, his face a mixture of guilt and frustration. What Mom means is, we're worried about how we'll manage while you're recovering. You know we depend on your income. The weight of their expectations— their constant demands pressed down on me like a physical force. I realized in that moment that nothing would change. They would drain me dry, squeeze every last ounce of life from me, and still demand more. Get out, I whispered. What? Ethan looked surprised. I said, get out. My voice rose, strength I didn't know I had surging through me. Both of you, leave. Now. As they left, shock evident on their faces, I made a decision. This was it. The last straw. When I left this hospital, I wouldn't be going back to that house. I wouldn't be going back to that life. I reached for my phone with shaking hands. It was time to call my sister. It was time to get out. The day I was discharged from the hospital, my sister Rachel was waiting for me. Ethan and Lydia hadn't bothered to show up, probably too busy figuring out how to access my bank accounts in my absence. You ready to go? Rachel asked, her eyes filled with concern. I nodded, feeling a mix of fear and determination more than ready. As we drove to her place in L.A., 
I filled Rachel in on everything that had happened. She listened in shocked silence, occasionally shaking her head in disbelief. Clara, I had no idea it was this bad, she said finally. Why didn't you reach out sooner? I sighed. I guess I was ashamed, and hopeful things would change. When we arrived at Rachel's apartment, my phone exploded with messages and missed calls from Ethan and Lydia. I turned it off, unable to deal with their drama. For the next few days, I focused on recovering and planning my next steps. Rachel introduced me to her friend Sarah, a sharp-witted divorce attorney who listened to my story with growing outrage. Clara, what they've done to you is financial abuse, Sarah said firmly. We need to act fast to protect your assets and your future. With Sarah's help, I began the process of untangling my finances from Ethan's. It was then that I discovered the true extent of their spending. Credit cards maxed out, savings depleted, even a second mortgage on the house I'd worked so hard to pay for. They've been bleeding you dry, Sarah said, her voice tight with anger. But we're going to put a stop to it. A week after I'd left, Ethan finally tracked me down. He showed up at Rachel's apartment, pounding on the door. Clara, I know you're in there. He shouted. You can't just abandon your family like this. I opened the door, stealing myself. I'm not abandoning anyone, Ethan. I'm saving myself. His face contorted with rage. You selfish bitch. Do you have any idea what you've done? We can't pay the bills. Cassius needs new clothes for school and mom's medication. Stop, I interrupted, my voice surprisingly calm. Your financial problems are not my responsibility anymore. I'm done being your personal ATM. You can't do this to us, he snarled. We're family. I laughed bitterly. Family? Is that what you call lying to me for years, manipulating me, driving me to the brink of death with stress? No, Ethan, we're not family. We're done. I slammed the door in his face, my heart pounding. As his shouts faded, I turned to find Rachel and Sarah watching me with a mix of pride and concern. You did good. Sarah said. Now let's make it official. The next day, we filed for divorce. I also froze all joint accounts and removed Ethan and Lydia's access to my personal finances. It felt like cutting off a gangrenous limb, painful but necessary for survival. The backlash was immediate and vicious. Lydia launched a smear campaign, telling anyone who would listen that I was a neglectful mother who had abandoned her family. Cassius, manipulated by his grandmother, sent me hateful messages that broke my heart. But the worst blow came when I received a letter from Ethan's lawyer. They were contesting the divorce, claiming I was mentally unstable due to my stroke. They wanted full control of all our assets and were even pushing for alimony. I felt the world closing in around me. How could they do this? How could they twist my illness against me, try to strip me of everything I'd worked for? As I sat on Rachel's couch, the letter crumpled in my fist. I felt a familiar wave of dizziness wash over me. The stress was threatening to overwhelm me again, to drag me back into that dark place. But this time, I refused to let it win. This time, I would fight back. I looked up at Rachel and Sarah, my voice steady despite the tears in my eyes. I want to counter Sue. For everything. It's time they learned they can't push me around anymore. Sarah nodded, a fierce gleam in her eye. Let's do it. It's time to show them who they're really messing with. As we began to plan our strategy, I felt a surge of strength. The battle ahead would be tough, but for the first time in years, I was ready to fight for myself. And this time, I wouldn't back down. The courtroom felt suffocating as I sat beside Sarah, my hands trembling slightly. Across the aisle, Ethan and Lydia glared at me, their faces masks of righteous indignation. Cassius wasn't present, and my heart ached at his absence. All rise, the bailiff called out, and the judge entered. As the proceedings began, Sarah presented our case with razor-sharp precision. She detailed the years of financial abuse, the manipulation, and the toll it had taken on my health. I felt exposed, my private pain laid bare for all to see, but I held my head high. Then it was Ethan's lawyer's turn. He painted a picture of me as an unstable, neglectful mother who had abandoned her family in their time of need— he even suggested that my stroke was a convenient excuse to shirk my responsibilities. Your Honor, he said, his voice dripping with false concern. Mrs. Nut Thompson's erratic behavior and sudden departure from the family home raised serious questions about her mental state. We believe it would be in everyone's best interest if Mr. Thompson were granted full control of their joint assets. I felt a surge of panic. 
Could they really do this? Could they strip me of everything I'd worked for? Sarah squeezed my hand reassuringly before standing. Your Honor, if I may? She proceeded to present evidence of Ethan and Lydia's reckless spending, the maxed-out credit cards, the second mortgage they'd taken out without my knowledge. She even had statements from my doctors confirming that the stress of my home situation had directly contributed to my stroke. As she spoke, I watched Ethan and Lydia's faces. Ethan looked increasingly uncomfortable, while Lydia's eyes darted around the room, as if seeking an escape route. Then came the bombshell. Your Honor— Sarah said, We have evidence that Mrs. Lydia Thompson has been siphoning money from Clara and Ethan's joint accounts into a private offshore account for years. The courtroom erupted in murmurs. Lydia's face went pale, while Ethan turned to her in shock. Furthermore, Sarah continued, We have reason to believe that this money is connected to the inheritance from Ethan's biological father, the wealthy man Mrs. Lydia Thompson had an affair with years ago. I watched as Ethan's world crumbled around him. He stared at his mother, betrayal etched across his face. The judge called for order, his gavel echoing through the courtroom. In light of this new evidence, we'll take a brief recess. Court will reconvene in one hour. As we filed out of the courtroom, I felt a mix of vindication and exhaustion, but the battle wasn't over yet. In the hallway, Ethan approached me, his face a storm of emotions. Clara, I— I had no idea about the money, about my father, none of it. For a moment I felt a flicker of sympathy for him, but then I remembered all the years of neglect, of dismissal, of choosing his mother over me time and time again. It doesn't change anything, Ethan, I said quietly. You made your choices. Now you have to live with them. As I turned away I saw Cassius standing at the end of the hallway, his eyes wide with confusion and hurt. My heart clenched. Cassius, I called out, taking a step towards him. But before I could reach him, Lydia appeared, grabbing his arm and pulling him away. Don't listen to her lies, darling, I heard her hiss. She's trying to turn you against us. Cassius looked back at me, uncertainty in his eyes, before disappearing around the corner with Lydia. I felt my knees go weak, and Sarah quickly guided me to a nearby bench. It's not over, Clara, she said firmly. We're close, so close to ending this once and for all. As we sat there, waiting for the court to reconvene, I felt a strange mix of hope and despair. I was on the verge of reclaiming my life, my finances, my freedom, but at what cost? Had I lost my son forever? The bailiff's voice rang out, calling us back into the courtroom. This was it, the moment that would decide everything. With a deep breath, I stood up, squaring my shoulders. Whatever happened next, I was ready to face it. For the first time in years, I was fighting for myself. And I wasn't about to give up now. Five years had passed since that fateful day in court. I'd won my freedom, my finances, and a new life, but the cost had been high. Cassius, manipulated by Lydia's lies, had chosen to stay with his father. The pain of that loss never truly faded. I was sipping coffee on the balcony of my L.A. apartment when my phone buzzed, an unknown number. I answered cautiously. Mom? The voice was deeper, but I'd know it anywhere. Cassius? My heart raced. Is everything okay? There was a long pause. Not really. Can, can we talk? In person? An hour later, I opened my door to find not just Cassius, but Ethan too. They looked defeated. Ethan's hair had gone gray, and Cassius, now twenty-one, had a wariness in his eyes that broke my heart. Come in, I said, stepping aside. They sat on my couch, looking out of place in my new life. I perched on the edge of an armchair, waiting. Ethan spoke first. Clara, I, we, we, we need your help. I felt a familiar tightness in my chest. What kind of help? Cassius looked up, his eyes pleading. We're broke, Mom. Grandma Lydia. She took everything. The house, the cars, even Dad's inheritance. She's gone, disappeared to some tropical island. We've got nothing left. I sat back, stunned. How? Why? Ethan's face crumpled. After you left, things fell apart. I couldn't hold down a job. Lydia kept spending, saying her connections would save us. But it was all lies. She was just using us like she always had. A part of me wanted to say, I told you so, but the broken looks on their faces stopped me. I'm sorry, I said instead. That must have been hard. Cassius leaned forward. Mom, I know we don't deserve it. I know I've been terrible to you. But we need help, just to get back on our feet. I looked at them, these two men who had once been my whole world, who had hurt me, neglected me, pushed me to the brink, and I felt, 
Nothing. No anger. No resentment. Just a calm certainty. I can't, I said softly. Their faces fell. Ethan opened his mouth to argue, but I held up a hand. I can't give you money, I continued. That's not what you need. What you need is to learn to stand on your own feet, to take responsibility for your lives. I turned to Cassius. I can help you apply for college scholarships. I'll even co-sign a student loan if you need it, but you have to do the work. Then to Ethan. I know a program that helps older adults retrain for new careers. I'll give you the information, but you have to commit to it. They stared at me, a mix of disappointment and... Was that respect in their eyes? Why would you help us at all? Ethan asked. After everything we did? I smiled, feeling a weight lift from my shoulders. Because I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for me, for the woman I've become, the woman who knows her worth and won't let anyone diminish it again. As they left, promises to consider my offers ringing hollow, I felt a sense of closure wash over me. I'd faced my past, stood my ground, and come out stronger. My phone buzzed again. A text from Rachel. Guess what? Lydia's been arrested in Bali for fraud. Karma's a bitch, huh? I laughed out loud, a free, joyous sound. The final piece had fallen into place. Justice, in its own twisted way, had been served. I walked back out to my balcony, looking out over the city I now called home. The sun was setting, painting the sky in brilliant oranges and pinks. A new day was ending, but for me, it felt like a beginning. I'd lost a family, yes, but I'd gained something far more precious, myself. And as I stood there, bathed in the warm glow of the setting sun, I knew with absolute certainty that I was going to be okay. More than okay, I was going to thrive. 